So greed, hatred, and delusion, uh, we all uh, Buddhist monks also talk about that, how to get rid of that. I think with this, um, you are um, very entertaining uh, way. Uh, that methodology, I think, can be very helpful to us. Um, we have some comments and questions from some people. It is time for them uh, to uh, post any question if we have. So Happy Smiley says, Guide uh, Billy Tan is here, video chat with Dhamma USA, Bhante Sumita. Billy Tan has been a great guide to my life, gradual changing on original Buddha's Dhamma teaching experience. Okay, wonderful. I think Happy Smile, uh, Smiley has um, <laughs> posted a lot of comments here. May all beings, without exception, humans and non-humans, plants, animals, insects, all creatures, devas, gods, angels, all directions and all realms, etc. be well, comfortable, peaceful and happy. And I think he talks about Bhante Purnaji. Bhante Purnaji is the best kindness warmest teacher like the smiling buddha to clearly translate all the dhamma from pali text language to conventional uh, english maybe i would like to uh, invite uh, brother billy to say something about that yeah actually someone like bante punaji is very unique if you understand his background very quickly, I'll just talk about his background. When he was a child, he was very uh, attracted to uh, uh, Venerable Narada in, the, mm. in Sri Lanka. And mm. he wanted to become a monk. By the time of six or eight years old, he told his mother he wanted to be a monk. But the family mm. was a wealthy family and he was the only son. They didn't want him to become a monk. So basically, he obeyed his parents, and then, but his, his father passed away at a very young age. So he then studied. He was a very brilliant man. He studied to become a doctor, and he became a doctor, practiced as a doctor until uh, his mother passed away in his 30s. Mm -hmm. uh, by the time he was in his early 30s, his mother passed away. And that was the time he realized it's time for him to renounce and become a monk. So he was a doctor until mid-30s, then he became a monk. And during the time of his monkhood, he went to the U.S. because of his impeccable command of English, he was mm. sent to the U.S. to spread teachings using very beautiful and very precise conventional English because of his command of English. And then he went on to study and obtain two doctorates. First, a doctorate uh, in... in, uh, in uh, philosophy, which is uh, comparative religion. So he was able to look at Christianity versus Buddhism and so on, comparative religions. And then he went on to do a second doctorate, and that is a doctorate in psychology, where he studied very deeply about the, the science of the mind, also Freudian psychology and various forms of psychology. Then that's, that made him so knowledgeable that whenever he looks at the Pali Canyon and he, ex he explains something, he's using this full background of being a doctor, uh, <laughs> philosophy, and uh, psychology to explain the Dharma. And that's where I learned from him. So I too became very interested to bring in science to explain the Dharma because if we look at Dharma and try to explain using conventional terms, you know, we get lost in all that. But by showing you those examples in science, you will be able to understand why do we have lust, greed, and hatred, right? Because of these animal instincts inside us. We've got to learn to abandon them. So I think that right. is uh, plenty. Right. I remember I met him uh, when I visited uh, Malaysia in Kuala Lumpur, Buddhist Mahavihara in 2014. And uh, I think he was a resident monk there and he was mm -hmm. teaching... Um, both in U.S. and uh, back and forth in uh, Kuala Lumpur and U.S. So, yeah, I noticed he, he is uh, such a wonderful, um, knowledgeable monk to to address the, the people in the Western world, especially, and also people in the present day, the young people, and those people who are exposed to more scientific background 
people from uh, such uh, medical uh, backgrounds have more authenticity, I think, to talk. And when you are a Buddhist monk and you have already been a, uh, been a doctor, medical doctor, I think um, they can do so much for the benefit yeah. of them. And uh, yes, thank you so much, uh, Brother Billy, con for continuing that wonderful service of Bhante Punaji. So I have listened to many of his uh, teachings too, and now it is available uh, in so many forms, especially with the technology through YouTube and through a um, lot of um, CDs are available in Buddhist Mahavihara, I remember. Uh, yeah, that's very, very helpful. Um, I think um, Happy Smiley says Bhante Punaji and Bhante Pemaratana taught for realities of Dukkha suffering, the supernormal eightfold ways, mm -hmm. but teacher Samupada and the four seven factors of awakening clearly explained uh, by YouTube. <laughs> yeah, Happy Smiley is actually a lady. Mm. Uh, she's been asking a lot of questions from Singapore. Right. A very wonderful young lady who's asked a lot of questions and learning a lot about Dharma. Wonderful. And she's putting it in practice. Right. I can see that um, every moment we see good and bad asava, how are we going to survive with our conventional work and jobs to cultivate and develop the Buddha's Dhamma to gain freedom from suffering, dukkha, Anicca, Anatta. Maybe you can um, answer to this question. Actually, what's important is to train our thinking mind to be able to discern right from wrong, good from bad. That's why you can then see the asavas. And whenever you see something happen, don't judge it, right? But examine how it affects you. You know, Does this affect me one way or another? This is really the practice of Satipatthana. How does it affect my body in terms of stress? How does it affect my feeling? How does it affect my emotions, my chitta? How does it affect my thinking, my dharma? And if we are able to discern that, we, can we are actually practicing Satipatthana. And by doing so, we can learn how to discern and realize anicca, dukkha, and anatta. So practicing Satipatthana takes us one level higher beyond just abandoning greed, hatred, and delusion. So the next thing after you learn and understand and practice abandoning greed, hatred, delusion is then to study more about Satipatthana and put that into practice. And then you are able to rise one level higher. Bhante Punaji has always described that awakening is like a, a, the steps. Step by step, you go one step higher each time you practice and you then gain the fruits of your practice, you go one step higher. So it's like climbing the step, one step at a time. So therefore, the next step is to practice Satipatthana. Okay. Right. Okay. We have another question. Is meditation and cultivation and development of Dhamma the same? Basically, meditation is part of the practice, part of the cultivation. Cultivation is the putting it into practice. And when you, there's a very subtle difference between the word cultivation and development. Cultivation is purely about the actual practice only. Development is actually the advancement you gain from your practice, the evolution of your mind. You become wiser, you become a better person. That is called development. Cultivation is the act of practicing. Putting it into practice is called cultivation. But by practicing, you begin to benefit from the fruits of your practice. That is development. Then you're taking it one step higher. Uh, so basically, that is really what the two terms is about. And meditation is one of the most important practices. As pointed out in today's sharing, meditation is one of the most important practices that can help us tame our mind and train up our thinking brain. That is the important part, the, the prefrontal cortex. Okay, I hope that answers the question. Yeah. Yeah, I remember in Pali, bhave titi bhavana, when you cultivate, when you develop, um, that makes bhavana meditation. Yeah, so yes. sometimes so we can put all these things together, cultivation, development, 
meditation put together we can <laughs> maybe uh, call it uh, bhavana some of those um, attributes of meditation the um, bhavana is there um, yeah right we have another question of um, by dulani is the concept of amygdala similar to the concept of the five aggregates or is it embedded into the same concept as a whole uh this question <laughs> takes very long time to explain but i'll keep it very simple the amygdala is involved with the process of sensing what is happening that is the early part of the five aggregate the sanya part of the five aggregate and the sankara part of the five aggregate sensing what's going on and begin to construct but the amygdala is no longer involved with the the actual uh, sankara part right what the amygdala does is it actually creates bodily reaction so the practice of satipatthana will help us realize this bodily reaction that is kayanupasana and realize how it affects us in terms of the sensations and that is vedana nupasana and then how we begin to get affected in the mind and emotionally aroused and that's citta nupasana and finally how we can use our thinking mind to overcome all that and and realize anicca dukkha anatta and that is dhamma nupasana so this practicing satipatthana can help us overcome all the the clinging on to the five aggregates so the five aggregates is a little bit more complex than just simply uh, experiencing the environment it actually leads to the clinging if we are not careful right yeah i like the way you said like sometimes amygdala also um is active like a terrorist <laughs> yes both a bodyguard and a terrorist yeah. that's the yeah. paradoxical role of the amygdala right um in meditation we call sati is like our security guard so ah yes <laughs> yeah. right so amygdala avita, in... avita is the terrorist <laughs> yeah so do you think amygdala and sati or mindfulness they um, they have more um, close approximate um, proximity no amygdala is actually a, a very low level it's very low level it's our animal instincts mm. sati is our human thinking mm. so you can say sati is the human part the thinking part amygdala is the animal part the animal instincts mm. and the not amygdala the... is found also in all animals but the thinking brain is not necessarily found in all animals the prefrontal cortex is only found in humans mm. uh, some animals have a frontal lobe but they don't have the prefrontal cortex like uh, our ability to discern and judge right but also the the safety measures of our body is mostly taken care of by this right like <clears throat> the warning system the yeah, alarming okay. system <laughs> yeah the thinking part is actually the safety net protecting mm. us from harm mm. the ability to discern there's another question i think it is a little bit different do we have to take all 10 precepts in life or at least five will do well banti maybe you are the better person to answer this question <laughs> <laughs> yeah i think um, as a lay person uh, uh, it is very important you practice um, five precepts five precepts uh, if you practice seriously that can be really helpful um, but from time to time you should go um, like at least once a month i would say um go for eight precepts <laughs> you know um then you will see m- more benefit more difference so like um the 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 three extra precepts that we observe on a full moon day and uh, some other time can or if you attend a retreat that can be really really helpful for your uh, purification internal purification so i think in order to get rid of this uh, greed hatred and delusion five precepts eight precepts 10 precepts and more can be helpful the more you uh, observe the more beneficial it will be right yeah, especially yeah. the young samanera monks they observe eight 10 precepts 
and the lay people also can uh, observe ten percent. And uh, when it comes to the the monks, like upasampada monk, higher ordained monks, they have to observe much more than that, like 227 rules for the upasampada monks and 311 for uh, upasampada nuns. So there, there are more complex um, precepts that they have to observe. But as lay pe people, from time to time, you also should try. You should try like how important it is to practice, live like an arahant, an enlightened person. When you practice eight precepts or ten precepts, you will know exactly how they live like. So maybe go test um, <laughs> how the yeah. a life yeah. of an arahant, an enlightened person, when you practice eight precepts or ten precepts. That way you will see the the beautiful, uh, wholesome nature of uh, an, a living Arhanta person. Yeah, Bhante, yeah. I like the way you describe 5, 8, and 10. Actually, like Bhante Punaji mentioned, it's like steps. The first step to be a Buddhist properly is the five precepts. So you take the first step. Mm -hmm. Until your feet is very firm on the first step, when your five precepts are firmly practiced, then you should then take the next step or maybe just test the step, eight precepts, you know, try the eight precepts. And when you find the eight precepts is helpful, you now go and try the 10 precepts, one step at a time. And finally, when you are able to do the 10 precepts smoothly, maybe that's the time for renunciation. Right. <laughs> do the 227 or 311. <laughs> right. Whenever you are ready. <laughs> yeah, when you're ready, you know, but one step at a time. Yeah, that's why like five to six daily practice, um, yeah. regular practice, that is important. And it's from time to time, like on a full moon day, we go for eight precepts. Yeah, yeah. there are eight like precepts. Uh, things every full moon, there is an eight precept uh, retreat for the day. Yeah. I think you, could, you should join them. Uh, right, join right. those eight precepts. Yeah, Like uh, many uh, tra traditional Buddhist countries, they have this Uposata day or the full moon mm. day. Uh, activity so they observe eight precepts or ten precepts and uh, pushing you more uh, into that serious practice like um, uh, how to abandon how to abandon um, your greed towards food for example <laughs> right <laughs> the yeah. ahara tanha the craving for food um, yeah. you, um, you try to suppress at least for 24 hours uh, that mm. makes sense. you you should try that and then uh, also how to get rid of that entertainment and beautification and all these things in the seven precept. And then also how you become so simple and humble uh, by uh, abandoning those luxurious chairs and beds. That way you can become an um, inch closer to a life of an arahant. Yeah. So ten precepts can also be uh, much more um, wonderful and advanced. Yeah, from time to time, I think the lay people also should uh, take a look at them and uh, practice. Uh, that is much, um, uh, much beneficial to everyone. Okay, so we have, oops, um, now living in AI technology, artificial intelligence world technology world do we have to be a hermit <laughs> <laughs> actually we really don't need to be a hermit hermit is uh talking about going into the forest and staying there and staying away from the, uh, from these uh, the, the conventional world we don't have to do that we just have to restrain ourselves so it's not being a hermit, but basically being a calmer and more restrained person and not indulge in these pleasures too much. That doesn't mean you have to be a hermit. It just simply means you understand right from wrong, good from bad, what hurts you, what harms you versus what is helpful to you and just choose those that are, those that are good and let go and abandoning those that are not, not helpful. That's it. That's good enough. You don't have to be a hermit, right? So like technology, don't get too engrossed in all this uh, fancy technology of music and sound and videos and all that. P look at only videos that are teaching you something. 
Don't look at the videos that are making you excited. Right? Listen to sounds, chanting, or explanations, or teachings that help you learn to be smarter. Don't listen to music that make you all excited and all pumped up. And, and, you know? So that's really discerning good things from bad things. Mm. Even looking visually, looking at t- videos, looking at, the, uh, at movies that have a very good, powerful message. Instead of looking at those videos that are violent and make you feel oh, all angry and violent. So it's basically the ability to discern, practicing your thinking mind, choosing good from bad, right from wrong, helpful from harmful. Okay. I think um, the idea of practicing um, as a hermit, um, the idea of isolation, sometimes in, um, in this modern world like AI, technology, all these things we see now, how people are so much engrossed into that and they are overwhelmed with uh, uh, these equipment and they actually have lost uh, their self-identity to a certain extent and you become like a slave to these technology then that will be a problem so maybe um, like why it is important for all of us to have that self-care to look into ourselves, that vipassana, insight, meditation, um, that will be very helpful from time to time if you practice. Uh, if not, you are always depending on your um, now, now robo like a car and you know autopilot, and then also um, you have everything um, at your home, like uh, working for you, the robots and all. Um, in, I think sooner we will start to fly, you know, small cars will fly in the sky and um, you will see like that will be very stressful sometimes like um, you are being controlled uh, by the machines. So I think it's important sometimes you the practice that you need to work on. Even meditation, uh, Brother Billy, I think there are some uh, like meditate with machines. <laughs> they can't. <laughs> they can't meditate without machine. They are so much um, into that. And now in Buddhist meditation, I think we talk about without any external help, you need to self-sufficiently survive uh, with your own practice, so that you can survive uh, with any storms that's happening externally in the world. Whether it is uh, pandemic or whether it is um, um, like um, um, like external other um, unfortunate situations like um, earthquakes happened in um, Syria and uh, Turkey, and you see like lots of people have been distressed, stressful, and so when you are a practitioner, I think it will be much more helpful. So. To a certain extent, that isolation, that practice alone, uh, to talk to yourself, to be alone, um, sometimes like a hermit, you know, like maybe for an hour or two a a day, uh, that can sort of detox yourself from many other uh, toxic things are happening to you uh, in your system. Yeah. Bhatti, I like the word you use, self-care. That yeah. is very important. Self-care. And if we were to practice self-care, we realize what's good for us. And we train ourselves to be more calm, peaceful, and uh, loving, and happy. Self-care is different from self-promotion. Some yeah. people use technology to, for self-promotion. They go to Facebook and start to post all kinds of things just to enforce the idea that I know this, I, this, this I, me, or mine is so strong. So self-care, not self-promotion. Right. Self, uh, that can be ego-promoting. Yeah, <laughs> ego self-promotion right? is ego. Yes, yeah. ego in, in practice. Yeah. Right. All right. We have another question from uh, Dulani. Why does it seem difficult for much of the human population to understand the consequences behind the three unwholesome actions, mainly for those who defiles all truth about everything although oh 
I think is that one. Yeah. I think she has another question here. Okay, I think this one. I think this is basically talking about ignorance, hmm. Avija. That people are ignorant. They don't spend the time for self-care. They don't hmm. want to study and learn what helps them to be calm, peaceful, and happy. Hmm. They just want to get excited about, uh, uh, about their own emotions. They get carried away by emotions. So by not understanding the Dharma, they get carried away by emotions. So this is really also both opportunity as well as uh, their own willingness. There are people with the opportunity. They, they, they are living in countries where there's a lot of Dharma being taught, and yet some people, they don't bother to attend any of the Dharma talks. So it's about this ignorance, you know. So people are inherently ignorant until they, be, they wake up as Bhante Punaji pointed out, to awake from the dream of uh, the, the dream of delusions, you know. Mm -hmm. So, so it, it's all about uh, not allowing ignorance to control your life. Right. I think um, uh, now people are also so much, uh, you know, enslaved by this technology and many other things that uh, distraction they, yeah, a lot of distractions right now yeah. young children and all the other people they they don't know the value of their own um, personal insight uh, uh, you know journey uh, yeah. that can really make your life much more stronger um, brother Billy would you like to say um, about that like uh, the distractions that we have yeah. Uh, against that, um, you know, self-care practice. Yeah, okay. I just want to point out one thing that I seem to keep observing. A lot of parents, they don't spend enough time to train their children, to guide their children. And I see so many of them, I really feel so sorry for them and for the children. When the child wants something, and I see a two-year-old, three-year-old, and what do they do? They give the child the cell phone. They give the child the iPad to start playing with it and keep the child busy. So the child goes on, you know, busy with, his, with the cell phone and then never learn anything. The, the parent, instead of teaching the child, you know, this is good and that is good, the child never learns what is right from wrong, good from bad. The child only learns how to get distracted, how to enjoy the use of technology. And they grow up like that. So this is really very harmful. And this is what I like to warn all, all the people when you want to bring up your children. Don't use that iPad, the cell phone, as the proxy to parenthood. Teach your children right from wrong, good from bad. Teach them how to behave. This teaching is so important because it shapes their entire future. How you teach your child leads to what that person becomes. So it's very important for that. So that is the first part of it. The second part of it is all this technology that is so distracting. Now, technology is not all bad. We had, there were people who used very good technology to, this, to find these people buried underneath the rubbles in, in, in uh, Syria and in uh, Turkey and mm -hmm. be able to dig them out. So technology was very helpful for that. Yeah. But then there are also technology that can be very harmful. Some technology can do both. A gun, for instance. A gun can be used for hunting. A gun can be used for scaring away uh, uh, wild animals. But a gun can also be used for killing children in schools, which is what's happening throughout America. Almost every month there is a school shooting. Mm -hmm. So therefore, every technology can be used one way or another. It's like a knife. A knife can be used for cutting to do your cooking or a knife can be used for stabbing someone and killing someone. So we have to learn right from wrong, good from bad and examine everything, whether it can be helpful, very harmful. And this is the ability to discern, training this mind to be able to discern right from wrong. There is a sutra where the Buddha said that before he became enlightened, he had two kinds of thoughts. This is the two kinds of thoughts sutra where he could think of one is harmful thoughts and one is helpful thoughts. So he learned to choose the helpful thoughts. 
So that is a good sutra to look at. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, how Deva Sutra. Ved, Ved sutra. Yeah, yeah. yeah so choosing Ved, good that. things from bad. The Buddha explained that before he became enlightened, he was able to do that. And that mm -hmm. is what we should be able to teach our children, choosing what is helpful versus harmful. And that solves a lot of problems. Right? Yeah. The parents should know how to actually uh, be in control to a certain extent. Uh, like if you don't know how to do that, that will be a big uh, tragedy. <laughs> uh, because Sometimes uh, it's laziness. <laughs> laziness. Sometimes it's and, just laziness, yeah. yeah. They yeah, don't have time. They, they, they are they busy need... with their own thing. Yeah. <laughs> right, <laughs> right, right. So if you if you depend on your your smartphone or tab or something to lullaby your children, I think that's not going to work. That should be yeah, more human right. connection with the children and the parents, right? I remember yeah, like yeah, when yeah. we were little, um, we had that uh, beautiful connection with the with the mother and the father, how like when you um, are taken care of by the mother, like singing lullabies uh, by the yeah, mother. Yeah. So the mother's voice and her eye contact uh, and the touch of the mother uh, can be connected um, possibly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, can be connected. Connection. With the, yeah, yeah that, that's much more important than uh, using those um, technology all the time yeah. Uh, you know, to take care of the children. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Right. We've got to learn to use technology wisely. The yeah. cell phone can be used to play the music you sing along. As you sing to your child, you may want to have some background uh, accompaniment to it. You know, or you can use a, the, the technology to help to teach. It's a teaching aid to mm -hmm. teach the children and show the two children videos that are explaining good things versus bad things. So technology can be used in that way but never use a technology as the proxy to your parenthood. In other <laughs> words, just give the child your cell phone so you don't have to worry about the child. That yeah. is really, really very wrong. You know, yeah. that is ignorance to the extreme. Yeah, the thing yeah. is like it goes uh, out of proportion and parents yeah. can't do anything because the children are very persistent in demanding for, uh, for the phones. <laughs> You know, and yeah. they don't know yeah. how to control either. I'm so uh, engrossed with the with the videos and the cartoons and the games, especially the games mm. uh, yeah. have yeah. been um, introduced with uh, so much violent and you know aggra aggressive uh, nature. That's also the human psychology, as you said, more terrorist side of am amygdala is yeah, incorporated yeah. into more uh, more cartoons and uh, and the games so yeah, the children yeah. by nature by default they will also be improving inculcating developing those um, those um, um, aggressive activities uh, into their system that can be really yeah. dangerous right <laughs> okay um, where can we see all these scientific videos? Well, I think my sharing today will be posted and you will be played. Uh, right. By the way, in answer to, to this, these videos are actually ec I extracted from uh, a set of... Uh, so I, I actually purchased a lot of these videos, extracted them, and there's a clause in there that allows me to use it for educational purpose. Okay. Not for pet, not, not for profit. So, in other words, if it is used purely for educational purpose, there's nothing wrong for using these videos. These are coming from. Uh, I actually have a complete library of a lot of videos I purchased from overseas during those days when we were able to buy them on DVDs or even on old videotapes, and I extracted from them uh, from yeah. there. You know? Thank you so much. That's I think very helpful for our audience to take a look at these videos. To learn yeah, more, yeah. Uh, especially those parts of um, Bhante Punaji's teachings and also yeah. uh, some scientific background of um, the human uh, system, I think that will be very helpful. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. I like the power your power slide short to the point and connection between Dharma and science. Um, this is Kathy. Yeah.
and uh, Dulani say, okay, thank you for, um, although I in this live late, I apologize. Thank you for sharing your and uh, Hamaduru's knowledge when answering all of our questions. <laughs> thank you. Okay, thank you for joining. And what's her name? What is this name? I don't know how to. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thank you, Bhante Sumita, for teaching Pali and Dhamma. Thank you, Brother Billy, for promoting uh, the teachings of Bhante Punaji and all humanitarian works. I think that's a good uh, <laughs> uh, conclusion to our session. And so it has been a wonderful and productive session today with uh, Brother Billy Tan. I'm so happy to meet you again after some years. Uh, yes. Yeah, looking forward to hearing more from you uh, for the benefit of our community. And uh, with that, I think I would like to conclude today's session.